Believing in eternal love is beautiful and optimistic. But my story will show you that even in the apple of paradise, there can be a sneaky worm. I once led a charmed existence with a devoted spouse, a precious daughter, and the comfort of a home. Happiness was my constant companion until a single pivotal moment altered everything. It was the day my wife introduced her lover into our home, shattering my world with humiliation and confusion. Faced with the unbearable reality of betrayal, I realized there was only one path forward. Before that fateful day, I was William Henderson, happily married to the enchanting Livia, affectionately known as Liv. Our love story began in university, where I, a graduating senior in engineering, crossed paths with Liv, a junior, whose affection captivated me instantly. We embarked on marriage soon after her graduation, both of us securing promising careers, mine in engineering and hers as a legal assistant. For a time, our life was blissful, especially with the arrival of our daughter, Nancy. Yet, as Nancy grew and Liv resumed her career, cracks began to surface. Despite my unwavering belief in our love, signs of trouble were unmistakable. Liv's wardrobe grew more alluring, our intimacy waned, and her absences from home lengthened without explanation. I confronted Liv, hoping for reassurance, only to receive hollow promises of hard work for our future. In hindsight, I should have seen the truth behind her excuses. But blended by love and trust, I failed to recognize the impending storm until it was too late. Before that day, I had an encounter with Liv's boss, Adam Coleman, at the company's Christmas party. His demeanor struck me as arrogant and dismissive, though upon careful observation, I saw no overtly romantic gestures between him and Liv. Their interactions were subtle, yet concealed from my awareness. The tension reached its peak just as Nancy was wrapping up kindergarten and heading off for the weekend to stay with my parents. I had hoped to seize the opportunity to reconnect with Liv, to reignite the spark in our relationship. After dropping Nancy off at my parents' place, I returned home with plans for a cozy dinner and movie night alone with Liv. However, as I stepped into the kitchen, I was met with a sight that caught me off guard. Liv descended the stairs, adorned in a stunning dress, heels, with her hair meticulously styled and makeup perfectly done, ready for a night out. Wow, babe, you look incredible. I remarked, hopeful for our evening together. I wish you had let me know. We had plans. I would have rushed home. Just give me a few minutes to get ready. Where are we going? I asked, only to be met with a smirk from Liv, a sight that unsettled me. We're not going anywhere. I'm going out, but not with you, she replied cryptically. Confusion turned to shock as Liv continued. I have a date, and this is just the beginning. We're establishing new rules. Starting today, my boss is picking me up for a night out, and I will be home. We've got a room downtown. What the hell are you talking about? I exclaimed, unable to comprehend her words. You need to calm down and accept it. This is how it's going to be. I'm going out, and I'll be back sometime on Sunday. If you think I'm going to tolerate this, you're mistaken. If you walk out that door, don't bother coming back, she retorted, her tone firm and unwavering. No, William, I'm coming back to our home. We'll still be married, and I'll still live here, as will you. But you have to understand that I love you, but I need more. If you insist on making this hard, it'll be you who won't be living here anymore. It'd be a shame for Nancy's father to be broken in jail. Her remarks left me speechless. Just as I was about to address her, the doorbell chimed. Olivia hurried to the door to let her boss in. How did he react? He inquired. Not positively, I'm afraid. You might need to clarify the consequences of non-compliance, she replied. Adam, not particularly imposing, stood about my height, maybe slightly shorter. Mr. Henderson, it seems we have some matters to discuss. He began, a hint of assertiveness in his tone. I feel inclined to give you a piece of my mind. You could try that, though judging by your appearance, you might get a few hits in before my driver steps in and knocks you out. By nightfall, you'd find yourself behind bars, so please take a seat. I retorted calmly. Glancing past him, 
I noticed a burly man looming in the doorway, grumbling. I settled back down. Okay, now we can talk like civilized people. When your spouse agreed to work as my personal assistant, she also took on additional responsibilities. Yes, I suppose, including a part-time job in bed. I've been seeing your wife for the last five months, but she's grown tired of our clandestine meetings. The dynamic between you two will shift as my personal assistant. She will fulfill my professional and personal needs as required. Mr. Henderson, you're still Olivia's husband. Your role as a spouse and parent will remain unchanged, with one exception. Olivia rushed to the door to let her boss in. How did he react? He inquired. Not positively. I think you should explain the consequences of non-compliance, she replied. Adam, not particularly imposing, stood about my height, maybe a bit shorter. Mr. Henderson, it seems we have some matters to discuss, he said, his tone suggesting he had some grievances to air. You could try that, although judging by your appearance, you might land a few punches before one driver steps in and knocks you out. By nightfall, you'd find yourself behind bars, so please take a seat. I responded calmly. Glancing at the door, I noticed a burly man looming behind Adam rumbling. I settled back down. Okay, now we can talk like civilized people. When your spouse agreed to work as my personal assistant, she also took on additional responsibilities. Yes, including a part-time job in bed, I've been seeing your wife for the last five months, but she's tired of our secret meetings. The relationship between you two will undergo a change as my personal assistant. She will fulfill my professional and personal needs as required. Mr. Henderson, you are still Livia's husband. Your role as a spouse and parent will remain unchanged, with one exception. I will ensure Olivia is as comfortable as possible in bed with me, he declared, a chilling resolve in his tone. Usually, these matters are resolved in hotels or offices. But there may be instances, especially when you're away from home, where we'll need to use your bed. His words left me speechless. Just as I was about to respond, the doorbell chimed. Before I could inquire further, Olivia interrupted, her turn cutting. I will not tolerate this. You despicable man, I intend to end our marriage because of her infidelity, Mr. Henderson. Such language is futile, Mr. Henderson. Let's not forget my profession. I am a prominent lawyer working for the largest law firm in this city. If you file for divorce, there will be consequences, he warned, his voice dripping with authority. And I didn't just mean legal repercussions. Naturally, throughout the divorce proceedings, you'll lose everything and be burdened with alimony payments. As for your beloved daughter, you'll lose access to her facing serious charges of inappropriate behavior and parenting, resulting in imprisonment and permanent loss of parental rights. Most likely, you'll be terminated from your job. Immediately, your family and friends will disown you. He continued, his threats rattling me to the core. Stunned and speechless, I sat in disbelief as Adam pressed on. Now, I know you won't do anything foolish. If you dare to inform my wife, you'll face the dire consequences I just described, along with the visit from my driver and his associates. And if you attempt to flee town, we'll track you down. So be good lad and accept this new arrangement. With a final, ominous warning, he leaned in close to my ear, sending shivers down my spine. Your wife is an excellent assistant. She's exceptional at providing certain services. Still greeting from his threats, I watched in dismay as my wife left with her boss, now her boyfriend. I was devastated, unsure of how to cope with the situation. Turning to alcohol, I drowned my sorrows, only to wake up alone and hungover on Saturday morning. Olivia didn't return home on Saturday or Sunday morning. When I went to pick up Nancy on Sunday, struggling to hold back tears, Olivia was still absent. I couldn't bear the look of disappointment on Nancy's face when she asked where her mom was. Instead of telling her the truth, I said mom needed to work, feeling the pain of deceit deep in my heart. Finally, when Olivia returned home on Sunday night, I was already asleep in the guest room, grateful that she didn't come in. I wasn't sure if I could have kept my composure if she had. The next morning, as I was getting Nancy ready for school, Olivia appeared without much acknowledgement of me. Her focus was solely on Nancy as we left for school. 
She kissed Nancy goodbye and attempted to kiss me, but I turned away and left. Later that night, after Olivia had put Nancy to bed, she angrily confronted me in what I had designated as my man cave in the basement. Are we going to have an issue? She spat. When you say we, are you referring to my problem with you spending the weekend with your boss? Is that the problem you're talking about? She stood before me, hands planted firmly on her hips and said, I never thought this would happen. It all started innocently enough. When Adam and I had coffee one morning, he noticed the special creamer I bring to work. He seemed eager to share his signature blend with me. Don't be crass, William. Adam can be very persuasive. Do you remember when I used to claim I didn't like sushi? Truth is, I never even tried it. Adam insisted it was absolutely delicious. The first time he convinced me to try it was also the first time we grew close. I'm sorry, William, but it felt amazing. He even promised to promote me to the position of his personal assistant. Just think about the benefits, a higher salary, opportunities to travel with Adam and meet influential people. It's a win-win for us. And Adam mentioned that you could re-enter a relationship under certain conditions. Oh my God, I can't wait to hear about these conditions, I retorted, feeling my anger surge. You can't speak to me like that, William. You need to accept this reality. This isn't a permanent arrangement, just a couple of years at most. It gives us a much better chance at a future together. Olivia reasoned, her voice tinged with desperation. Do you honestly believe all this nonsense? I shot back. So, in your world, once the esteemed Adam is done with you, I'm just supposed to be there to grow old with you. And then what? Wait until good old Adam decides he wants to impregnate you and has some other guy raise a child. Olivia hung her head in shame. Oh, Dan, are you already pregnant? I questioned sharply. No, but he's suggesting I stop taking the pill in a few months, she admitted. I told him I wanted you to be fully on board with our new relationship before we consider that. I can't believe this. Get out of my sight. I uttered in disbelief. Olivia reached the top of the stairs and turned back. Be waiting in our bed. But once I stop taking the pill, I will be available to you until... You know, she trailed off, the gravity of the situation sinking in. This was getting out of hand. She needed to understand that I would never go along with her plan. I retreated to the guest room and my basement area, trying to maintain normalcy for Nancy's sake. In the following week, I delved into researching Adam, discovering his wielded power and influence. He casually mentioned consulting a divorce lawyer, hinting at the potential ruin such a step would bring upon me. Knowing that divorcing him was not a feasible option, I sought legal counsel. The lawyer, acquainted with Adam Coleman, expressed concerns that he might resort to fabricating molestation allegations against me. Divorce seemed like an insurmountable obstacle. Instead, the lawyer suggested gathering evidence of my wife's collusion with Adam. If I could procure proof of their conspiracy against me, perhaps I could thwart their plans. However, she cautioned that even with evidence, overcoming Coleman's authority would be challenging. She recommended using a discreet voice-activated recorder, suggesting that placing it in Olivia's purse could potentially yield valuable information. Following her advice, I acquired a recorder resembling a pen and stealthily tucked it into Olivia's purse alongside other pens. Despite recognizing the slim chance of success with the recorder alone, I began exploring alternative options, finding myself limited within the confines of legality, yet determined to find a solution. I headed to the library, leveraging my knowledge gleaned from countless detective TV dramas, understanding the significance of police scrutiny on the prime suspect's internet search history. After scouring for hours, a risky idea was born out of desperation. Embarking on a three-hour drive, I stumbled upon a dingy oriental supply store shrouded beneath an old hat, sunglasses, and manuscript attire, ensuring my anonymity as I sought a solution. Fortunately, upon entering, I found the store deserted, save for the elderly gentleman tending the counter. Approaching him cautiously, I inquired, I'm in need of tetralotoxin and dinophil mercury. The old man met my gaze with a knowing smile. Dealing with a cheating spouse, I returned. His smile broadened. 
Can you provide what I seek? I asked. Indeed, but it comes at a price. One thousand, one hundred dollars cash only. I assume discretion is paramount for you, he replied. I counted out one thousand, one hundred and twenty dollars and placed it on the counter. The elderly man disappeared through a back door and swiftly returned, handing me two vials in a paper bag. Be cautious with these small doses over time. They will be effective, he advised. He included two syringes in the bag. These will assist in administering it. Avoid contact with your skin. It's advisable to dissolve it in a liquid for consumption. I snatched the bag and hurried to my car. Tetrodotoxin and dimethylmercury are both poisonous substances associated with marine life. Tetrodotoxin is derived from pufferfish and blue-ringed octopuses. When properly prepared, these creatures are considered delicacies, but in concentrated form, they can prove fatal as they accumulate in the body. Dimethylmercury is akin to mercury, but more lethal. If allowed to accumulate, it too can be deadly. My research unveiled that both dimethylmercury and tetrolotoxin would gradually build up in the body until it became irreversible. Detecting these substances was a challenge, but if uncovered, they would mimic symptoms of food poisoning from spoiled sushi. The most advantageous aspect of my plan was that Olivia would unknowingly handle the delivery of the poison for me. She kept that cursed special creamer at home until it was time to replace the bottle at work. A few months prior, when I questioned why she didn't bring it all to work at once, she expressed concerns about it being taken by someone else. The creamer was her personal indulgence, exclusively for her and Adam. It was non-dairy and didn't require refrigeration, stored in the pantry in an open case of 10 bottles. Carefully selecting one for inspection, I noted the cap wasn't tamper-proof, but there was a paper and foil seal beneath it. Deciding to start with tetrodotoxin in the first bottle, I avoided risking exposure to dermethylmercury, known to be fatal upon contact. Following instructions, I loaded the syringe with tetrodotoxin and cautiously pierced the seal. After injecting the liquid slowly, I scrutinized the bottle for signs of tampering, feeling satisfied. Repeating the process with all 10 bottles with a trembling hand, I then proceeded with dimethylmercury, injecting each bottle with much greater care. Two weeks later, the supply of cream was reduced to nine bottles. Guilt began to consume me, I regretted my resolute actions. However, Olivia's behavior made my decision much easier to bear. It was Thursday evening, our designated sushi night. Olivia and Adam often worked late, bonding over sushi, a symbol of intimacy. After dinner with Nancy, I tucked her into bed before retreating to my man cave as usual. Olivia descended the stairs, a defiant look in her eyes. If you're expecting intimacy, you have a month left. Adam, I decided I'll stop taking birth control pills in a month. After that, I'll only be with Adam, she declared. Rage surged within me. My own wife was dictating when I could be intimate with her before conceiving a child with her boss. I'll be upstairs in our bed. It's been too long since we've been close, she added smugly, climbing the stairs. You've forgotten what real intimacy is, I retorted. Some might argue I'm going too far, and should simply end the marriage. But given my circumstances, I saw my actions as self-defense. Both she and her boyfriend had threatened what I hold most dear, my daughter and my freedom. While I acknowledged the reprehensibility of my actions, they were provoked by the unspeakable threats they made. A week later, I noticed there were only nine bottles of creamer left in the box. It took another month for the first symptoms to surface. I kept a close eye on Olivia whenever she was home. Her complexion seemed paler, but it was her hands that caught my attention. Throughout dinner, Olivia was flexing her fingers and wringing her hands, indicating that her nervous system was being affected by the toxins in the creamer, leading to its shutdown. Is something bothering you, Liv? I try to show genuine concern. I don't know. My fingers feel numb. You know, like when you lay on your hand and it falls asleep. It's been happening for about a week. I've also been feeling a bit short of breath. It's probably nothing serious. Sounds like stress. Any new challenges at work stressing you out or making you uneasy? 
Olivia's response was accompanied by a slight sneer. No, everything's fine at work. I'm sure it's nothing, she replied dismissively. Two weeks later, the container had only seven bottles of creamer left. They must be consuming a lot of coffee, I mused to myself. Olivia's symptoms were becoming increasingly apparent, body aches, shortness of breath, and a pallor to her skin. It was a Thursday evening, and Olivia came home straight after work, surprising me as she walked through the door. What are you doing here, Liv? Isn't it sushi night? I remarked, dripping with sarcasm. I'm not feeling well and neither is Adam. He decided we're not working late tonight, she explained. Well, that's unfortunate timing, isn't it? I responded, noting her confusion. You know, that big project you and Adam were supposed to start. It's hard to deliver if you're both sick, I added. Olivia approached me closely to whisper, ensuring Nancy wouldn't overhear. Don't be rude in front of our daughter, she cautioned. After dinner, I decided to lie down for a while. I escorted Nancy to her room to prepare for bed. Passing by our bedroom, I heard the sounds of Olivia vomiting. Cautiously, I opened the bathroom door. You're not suggesting you're pregnant already, are you? I asked, frustration evident in my voice. Dan you, she snarled. I'm not pregnant yet. I only stopped taking the pill last week. Have some decency. I'm really unwell here. Decency. That's amusing coming from you. I'm your wife, William. And you ought to treat your wife with respect and decency, she retorted. No, my wife died when she took that job with that jerk. She was replaced by some woman I have no respect for. If you think you'll receive any decency, respect, or even kindness, you're mistaken. I interrupted sharply, turning and leaving the bathroom, leaving her by the toilet, retching. The next day, Olivia wasn't awake when I dropped off Nancy at her daycare. Although I should have checked on her, I didn't bother. Around noon, my phone buzzed with a message from Olivia. What do you need? I responded. I need you to take me to the hospital. What's wrong? I asked. I'm sick, but it's not me. It's Adam. He's had a stroke, she replied. I couldn't help but chuckle at the irony of the situation. Are you seriously asking me to take you to see your lover in the hospital? I asked incredulously. Please, William. This isn't a joke. They said he might not make it. Olivia replied, her concern evident. Worry of raising suspicion, I decided to take the afternoon off. When I got home, Olivia looked terrible. I helped her into the car and drove to the hospital. There, we encountered her boss's wife and one of the other senior partners, Willie Barnes. The senior partner swiftly took Olivia aside. It was clear he knew about their affair. Liv, do you really think you should be here? His wife is over there, I interjected. Oblivious to my presence, Olivia urgently addressed Barnes. Mr. Barnes, I must know his condition. I need to see him. Barnes motioned for her to step aside with me following closely. You look terrible, Liv. The situation isn't good. He's experiencing paralysis on his left side, and the doctors have mentioned organ failure. They're uncertain about the cause. But if they can intervene soon, he might not make it through the weekend, Barnes informed us. Olivia broke into tears, pleading, Please, Mr. Barnes, I have to see him. Could you distract his wife while I sip in? Barnes gathered with Adam's wife and relatives. I accompanied my wife to visit her lover. Adam looked terrible, with the left side of his face sagging. Though awake, he couldn't speak. Olivia rushed to his side, while I remained by the door. It made me sick to see her hug and kiss him, knowing I was in the same room. Olivia sobbed harder until the nurse entered, urging her to leave. The nurse assisted my wife out of the room, leaving just Adam and me. Adam's eyes widened as he recognized me. He attempted to speak, but no words emerged. Adam, you're on your deathbed. Before you go, I want you to understand that I didn't heed your advice. I wasn't faithful, and I rejected your notion of a new relationship. Don't fret. I'll inform your wife after you've gone about all the deceit you engaged in with me and my wife. Before you pass, 
Know that I orchestrated this. There's nothing you can do to stop it, you bastard. I said, alarms beginning to sound from the machines connected to Adam as I exited the room. Prompting nurses and doctors to rush in, they managed to keep Adam alive through the weekend, but he passed away early on Monday. Upon hearing the news of her boss's passing, Olivia was overcome with emotion, her health deteriorating further. After picking up Nancy from daycare that Monday, I returned home to find Olivia in bed. She confirmed the loss of her lover, bitterness still evident despite her weakened state. I suppose you're going to revel in this now, she accused bitterly. No, Liv, I'm not going to revel. I won't pretend to mourn his death. He ruined our marriage and he got what he deserved, I replied firmly. Our marriage isn't ruined and I can't believe you're so heartless about Adam. My feelings for him didn't diminish my love for you. It was just a means to improve our financial situation. You knew I would always come back to you, Olivia argued tearfully. No, Liv, that's nonsense. Our marriage is as dead as Adam. Remember, I was in the room when you professed your love to him. Right in front of me, I retorted, leaving the bedroom as Olivia dissolved into tears. By the end of the week, her condition worsened to the point where I had to rush her to the hospital. On Friday, the physician spoke to me. Mr. Henderson, your wife's bodily functions are failing. Her blood indicates unusually high levels of mercury and another toxin commonly found in fish. Does she consume a significant amount of seafood? Perhaps sushi, the doctor informed me. I struggled to stifle a laugh. Yes, she and her partner have been indulging in sushi frequently over the past few months. Partner? The doctor inquired, puzzled. I'm certain you're aware of him. Adam Coleman, the man who passed away in this hospital just this past Monday. He and my wife were involved in an ongoing affair. That clarifies matters. Despite his stroke, her symptoms closely resemble those of Mr. Coleman. Unfortunately, I fear she doesn't have much time left. Her kidneys failed early this morning. It's just a matter of time. I explained solemnly. The doctor escorted me to her room. Olivia was connected to various machines, appearing extremely frail. Her eyes brightened as I entered weakly, gesturing for me to come closer. Her breathing was strained, and speaking was difficult. Olivia signaled for me to lean in. I'm so sorry, William. I now understand how deeply I've hurt you. The doctor informed me that I don't have long. I need to hear, forgive me, before I depart. She managed to whisper. I leaned in and whispered my forgiveness into her ear, finding her with a smile. As I began to speak, my beloved wife, I promised my eternal love to you. When we exchanged vows through thick and thin, in sickness and in health, those were my words, I said, my voice steady yet firm. Simultaneously, you vowed your love and loyalty to me, but you violated those promises by demeaning and humiliating me. I cannot forgive you for what you've done to me and our family. As a tear rolled down her cheek, Olivia whispered, May you and your lover suffer in hell. I stood up and left as the alarms blared in Olivia's room. Less than an hour later, she was pronounced dead. Telling Nancy that her mother wouldn't be returning home was agonizing. My tears were for her, not for Olivia. Olivia had attempted to end my life as I knew it, but I thwarted her. The doctors concluded that both Adam and Olivia had fallen victim to tainted sushi. Handing Olivia's body over to the funeral home signaled the end of any autopsy or further inquiry. No police officers ever approached me for questioning. I disposed of the surplus bottles of creamer and my toxin vials at home. I even retrieved the partially full bottle of creamer from Olivia's office when I collected her belongings. When I arranged for Olivia's body to be cremated, her parents objected due to their religious beliefs against cremation. However, I disregarded their objections as I was determined to destroy any remaining evidence by cremating her body. Despite seeking revenge on Olivia and Adam, I found no satisfaction in it. Gathering my recordings, I made duplicates and headed to Caroline Henderson's home, Adam's widow. One might question why I confronted Adam's wife now that he was deceased. 
My intention was to ascertain her awareness and potential complicity in the events. Caroline welcomed me into her home, displaying an openness that only confirmed my suspicions. I switched on my pocket recorder. Mrs. Coleman, I've come to discuss your husband and my wife with you, I began. But she interrupted me. You can stop there, Mr. Henderson. I was aware of my husband's affair with your wife. Their affair was quite conspicuous. While it may not have been his first, it certainly was his last. I regret what happened to your wife, but as you can see, I also lost my husband. Thank you, Mrs. Coleman. I want to clarify something. You are aware that your husband lured my wife away and turned her against me and my daughter by not taking any action. You're just as culpable as he was, I asserted. Wait a minute, Mr. Henderson. I had no involvement in my husband's actions, she retorted. I suppose we'll have to disagree on that, Mrs. Coleman. From my perspective, if you had intervened with your husband, he might not have felt emboldened to pursue my wife. Perhaps my child would still have a mother today. Knowing that you were aware of the situation will strengthen my case when I pursue his estate. Despite leaving Caroline's house without further discussion, fueled by a desire for revenge for the pain inflicted upon my family, I remain resolute. Despite my lawyer's warnings about the slim chances of success in pursuing Adam's estate, I was driven by vengeance. Not only did I target the Coleman estate, but I also aimed to hold the firm where Adam and Olivia worked accountable. Initially, my lawyer doubted they'd oppose us without Adam. However, that changed when I presented a recording of Adam conversing with his partner, Willie Barnes. As my scheme unfolded, maintaining civility with Olivia became increasingly challenging. During one of my outbursts, the recorder captured a crucial conversation between Adam and Willie in Olivia's office, discussing my resistance to their scheme. On the recording, Willie offered his assistance in implementing the plan, boasting of connections to law enforcement and the judiciary. He threatened to use these connections to dismantle me if I didn't comply. Though my lawyer cautioned about the recording's admissibility in court, we still leveraged it. Skylar arranged a meeting with all the senior partners, including Willie Barnes, without divulging the exact reason, merely suggesting it might pertain to life insurance. I aimed for them to be caught off guard as we entered their conference room. Each of the seven senior partners, including Barnes, offered their condolences for my wife's passing as we sat in the conference room. They all assumed the meeting pertained to Olivia's delayed life insurance policy, which our firm had provided. Dallin Bennett, the managing partner, rose from his seat to address me directly. Mr. Henderson, please accept our sincere condolences for your loss, he began. We understand the challenges you face in securing the payout from the insurance company for your wife's policy, which our firm provided. I'm pleased to inform you that we successfully intervened to overcome the hurdles. With that, Bennett handed me a check for $450,000 from the insurance company. However, I made it clear that the purpose of our meeting was not solely to discuss the insurance payout. Mr. Bennett, while I appreciate your efforts regarding the insurance matter, that's not the primary reason for our presence here today, I stated firmly. We're here to address a troubling matter regarding your firm's involvement in a scheme orchestrated by Mr. Coleman. Bennett's expression shifted from sympathetic to defensive. How dare you come in here and accuse our firm of such crimes and tarnish the reputation of one of our deceased partners, Mr. Coleman, he retorted indignantly. We won't sit here and let you make false allegations. I remain steadfast. All allegations I bring forward are true. And I have evidence to support them, I asserted. I suggest you simply ask Mr. Barnes. All eyes turned to Barnes, who visibly squirmed in his chair under the scrutiny. It became apparent that they were awaiting his response to refute my claims, but he remained silent, as instructed by my lawyer. A snippet of the incriminating recording between Barnes and Coleman, detailing their plot against me, played from my lawyer's firm, echoing through the room, Bennett's expression shifted, and he swiftly rose from his seat, glancing at his partners before turning back to us. Mr. Henderson, if you would allow us a moment, Bennett requested, gesturing towards his partners. Twenty minutes later, Bennett returned alone, his demeanor more composed. What are your terms? he inquired, 
addressing me directly. Your firm will compensate me and my daughter with $2 million, or else we will pursue legal action. I nodded, maintaining my resolve. And if you refuse, incriminating recordings I've shared with you will become public knowledge, I added. My lawyer informs me that Barnes is likely to lose his license to practice law, and the same fate may await the rest of your team. Bennett requested a few days to deliberate with his partners, but my lawyer interjected firmly. You have two days to agree, or we go public with everything, he asserted. Three days later, my attorney informed me that they had agreed to the $2 million compensation. As part of the arrangement, we agreed not to pursue any claims against Mr. Coleman's estate. In return, they would terminate Mr. Barnes from the firm, invoking a moral clause that would deprive him of 70% of his partnership share. I accepted the terms and received the funds. Additionally, I signed a non-disclosure agreement regarding the actions of Mr. Coleman and his firm towards me and my family. Olivia's affair had left our family financially secure, as she had predicted. Now, I had to begin the search for someone to fill the roles of my wife and mother to my child. With the $2 million compensation secured, I found myself grappling with the complexities of rebuilding our shattered family life. Nancy, my daughter, remained my beacon of hope amid the chaos. However, the void left by Olivia's betrayal and subsequent demise loomed large. In the days following the settlement, I focused on providing a sense of normalcy for Nancy. We embarked on weekend outings to parks and museums, seeking solace in each other's company. Yet, beneath the facade of stability, a gnawing emptiness persisted. One afternoon, while Nancy was engrossed in her favorite book, I received an unexpected call. The voice on the other end was warm and professional, introducing herself as Dr. Cassandra Hayes, a renowned psychologist specializing in grief counseling. Mr. Henderson, Dr. Hayes began, I've been following your story in the news. Your resilience is admirable, but I believe you and Nancy could benefit from some professional support during this challenging time. Though initially hesitant, I agreed to a consultation. Dr. Hayes' insights proved invaluable, helping me navigate the complexities of grief and betrayal. Over time, Nancy also developed a rapport with Dr. Hayes, gradually opening up about her feelings of loss and confusion. As the months passed, Nancy and I found solace in our newfound routine. One evening, while reflecting on Olivia's actions, a sense of closure began to take root within me. Despite the pain, I recognized that life was offering an opportunity for renewal. In a serendipitous turn of events, I crossed paths with Sarah, a kind-hearted widow and single mother, at a community event. Our chance encounter blossomed into a friendship, and before long, I found myself envisioning a future filled with hope and companionship. Sarah's gentle presence breathed new life into our home. With her support, Nancy flourished, her laughter echoing through the halls once more. Together, we navigated the delicate dance of bending our families, honoring the past while embracing the promise of tomorrow. Through the trials and tribulations, I discovered that healing was not an endpoint but a journey, one that led me to embrace the beauty of second chances and the transformative power of resilience. And as Nancy and I embarked on this new chapter, I carried Olivia's memory with me, a reminder of life's intricate tapestry and the enduring strength of the human spirit. Friends, leave a comment on how much you enjoyed this story. Mm -hmm.